I'm Billy S, welcome back to the channel. Today, we're jumping through time, equipping our best gear, and rolling absolutely everywhere as I rank every boss in The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Going from a 2D space to a 3D space presented a lot of challenges, but the Zelda team stuck to it, and with the introduction of Zed targeting, the bosses of Ocarina of Time were able to have a lot of depth to their battles. It's a big leap, which means each fight's mechanics have a more starring role, and the personalities can be on full display. Now, I've got a few pretty hot takes on this list, so please remember this is all just my opinion. I'm not looking to change anybody else's thoughts, I just want to share my own vibes with you. With all that being said, all 10 Ocarina of Time bosses ranked. Let me know your favourite down below. At number 10, we have Infernal Dinosaur King Dodongo, boss of the Dodongo's Cavern. A returning boss from the original Legend of Zelda, I absolutely love the introduction, as we see Link through the boss's eyes as he rolls up towards our pint-sized hero. Easily one of the more intimidating bosses, it's a shame then that the Dodongo is perhaps the easiest of the bunch to defeat. His main dangerous attack is his fire breath, which I'd normally say, be sure to avoid it or you'll take serious damage, but the reality is you will never see the flames, because in order to use the fire, the Dodongo has to inhale like Kirby, and we all know what that means. Bomb in mouth, explosion, stunned boss, attack with sword, rinse repeat. King Dodongo will try to roll into Link after recovering from the stun, but you can move to the edge of the platform to perfectly avoid taking any damage. As long as you've got a little spatial awareness, you will be fine. The novelty of seeing this classic NES boss in 3D is certainly an exciting prospect, but I can't help but wish this fight was a tad more complex. Just look at the Frox mini-boss in Tears of the Kingdom, which seemingly took the place of the Dodongo with similar mechanics. Only to do damage to them, you have to attack the ore on their back. We have certainly come such a long way. At number 9, we have Parasitic Armored Arachnid, Goma boss of Inside the Great Deku Tree. We've seen Queen Goma in 2D, where you had to shoot an arrow at the eye to take home a win, and now we're seeing Queen Goma in 3D, where you have to shoot a Deku Seed at the eye to take home a win. <laughs> She's not a complicated fight by any stretch of the imagination, target the eye, fire a seed, attack her while she's stunned, rinse and repeat once again. After each stun, she'll flee the scene after hearing there's a 1% discount on the eShop, and will clamber up onto the ceiling. If you attack her once she stands still, you'll stun her back down to the floor, and you can continue wailing on her for massive damage. But if you allow her a moment to breathe, I don't know why you would, she can summon three eggs that hatch into small Goma larvae. They're incredibly easy to kill, but can prove a hindrance to younger gamers. Obviously, I'm 26, I've played this game a ton, so I know how to rush Goma down immediately and get that quick win. But for this playthrough, I wanted to just see what else Goma had to offer, and I think had she been programmed to do her moves faster and not waste so much time with the climbing up to the ceiling, she could have been more threatening. I absolutely adore the way she's animated though, there's something about the eye and the way it rolls around in her skull, or the way she approaches with an angry expression that just works for me. I think this fight and King Dodongo are pretty much equal in terms of difficulty, but Goma just has a bit more personality, and that nets her the higher spot on today's list. At number 8, we have the giant aquatic amoeba, Morpha, boss of the Water Temple. While I certainly feel the rest of the fights on today's list are all far more complex than our first two entries, Morpha is a fight that feels interesting from a conceptual standpoint, but absolutely flops when it comes to the actual design of the fight. Your goal is to avoid the aquatic tentacles and hookshot the nucleus of the boss away from its protective agua. Doing this allows you to attack it with your sword for as long as you can keep it from jumping back into the water. It's entirely possible to get it trapped in a corner and just immediately win the fight if you're good enough. For me though, this boss fails because of the arena itself. 
It's so easy to run away from any of Morpha's attacks because the arena is so vast. But if you have a misstep or two like I did in this recorded run, you're dropped into the pit of water and forced to swim to a ladder while the boss does nothing. It won't attack you until you're back on dry land. I also think the platforms in the room center are just uninteresting because not a single soul is going to stand on those long term as they're far too dangerous. They included spikes along the walls of the arena in an attempt to keep players from sticking to the edges of the pool, but I don't think a single person has ever actually found those spikes to be a threat. Most of the bosses in the later half of the game have a moment where their attacks get tougher, or they bring out a new form, and I think Morpha could have really used something like this. It feels too repetitive as it is now, which is a shame because I've always enjoyed this boss's visual design. It says a lot when Dark Link, the mini-boss of the Water Temple, would have been a better fit for the actual boss of the temple. At number 7, we have the Great King of Evil, Ganondorf. The penultimate boss fight of the game, and the first true battle we get to face with our main antagonist. The build-up and the anticipation for this showdown is immaculate. The organ music in the background of the tower as you fight your way up, revealed to be playing by Ganondorf himself, is a brilliant touch. And when he starts the fight by destroying a large portion of the floor with a simple punch, that's the Triforce of Power right there. That being said, this battle ends up being a complete repeat of the Phantom Ganon fight from earlier in the game. You're playing energy tennis against the big bad in an attempt to bring him down. Because this isn't the first time we've experienced this, it doesn't hit quite as hard for me, even if we were trained for this moment with that last boss. But more than that, I learned that in this recorded playthrough, my depth perception has gotten worse with age, as the amount of times I whiffed on the energy tennis both in this fight and in Phantom Ganon's fight is quite frankly, embarrassing. I was so good at this fight as a kid, but something has clearly broken in me recently. The problem here is that you can't target Ganondorf like in the Phantom Ganon fight, as Navi has been locked out. Because of this, you have to manually keep Ganondorf in your sights and position yourself accordingly. Though I think ignoring my awful gameplay here, I feel that Ganondorf's human form has so much more to him than just energy tennis. Wind Waker, Twilight Princess, and Tears of the Kingdom all showcase how strong Ganondorf truly is at utilizing his Triforce of Power. Yet in this fight, you should just call it the Triforce of Magic instead. Also, it's an absolutely miserable experience if you accidentally fall down the hole in the arena, because you have to slowly climb back up while Ganondorf mocks and laughs at you. And god forbid you keep missing your light arrows after stunning the Gerudo. I'm never going to live this gameplay down, oh my god. At number 6, we have Ganon, the final boss of the game. His tower has crumbled, and all that remains is to escape the ruins and call it a day. Only Ganondorf, utilizing his Triforce of Power, transforms himself from man to beast, bringing about the classic Ganon character design we've all come to love over the years. Such an iconic form that it was recreated as its own boss fight in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. That being said, while I recognize the sheer importance of this fight, and I definitely think it delivers in terms of atmosphere, intensity, and difficulty, I've always found myself drawn to dungeon bosses in Zelda games over the antagonist fights, because I just think that's where the creativity is often on full display. At the start of the fight, the Master Sword is flung out of reach, and until you've done enough damage using the rest of your kit, you won't be able to retrieve it. Ganon only has one attack, which is to swipe at you with his dual swords, which admittedly takes away some of the threat. I think had he been given a fire breath or something extra to spice things up, I'd remember this fight more fondly. Instead, you bait an attack, hop around to his brightly colored tail, slash it, and as I've been saying constantly in this video, rinse repeat. You can also stun him with light arrows, giving you more than enough time to attack his weak point until Zelda passes you back the Master Sword, then just repeat the process until Zelda stuns the beast with her light magic and deliver the final blow with the Master Sword to end the fight. You can't use any other sword, it has to be the Master. 
Something I love about Ganondorf fights in these games is how you almost always have an element of help from your allies. Zelda and Navi are here, Midna and Zelda in Twilight Princess, Zelda in The Wind Waker, the Sages in Tears of the Kingdom. It's nice to see such a simple premise make its way through all the different generations of Zelda. I just wish Ganon had more attack power of his own to make the fight a tad more threatening, because then it would match the god tier mood lighting in the original. I'm not sure why they butchered that for the 3DS version. At number 5, we have the Sorceress Sisters, Twin Rover, bosses of the Spirit Temple. A pair of old hags, no, literally, they are old hags, as in witches. They rule over the temple for their baby boy Ganondorf, and have no problems imprisoning Noboru for seven years, nor do they have issues with fighting Hylian Twinks for their child. They're a fan favourite fight because their design and personalities are honestly some of the most fleshed out of the game, plus they play around with classic fire and ice tropes to great effect. In the first phase, Kum and Kotake will each take turns attacking you with either fire or ice beams, which you have to reflect in the direction of the opposing witch. I won't lie, while I love this concept on paper, there were many moments where I'd target either of the witches, but then the beam would just never connect or line up. It was far more a finicky system than I remembered, which led to some annoyance. Then they form Twin Rover, beginning the second phase. Here, the boss will begin firing elemental attacks at you, which you need to absorb with your mirror shield. The trick is that you can only absorb one element at a time, so you need to collect either three ice or three fire attacks to fully charge up. Then release the power, stun Twin Rover, and switch to your sword to go in for the kill. Of all the fights in Ocarina of Time, Twin Rover is, I think, the most mechanically in-depth, even more so than the final bosses. And if I were ranking based purely off of mechanics, Twin Rover would easily land in our number one spot. But I'll admit, I just prefer the aesthetics of the rest of the boss roster. It's pure bias from here on out. Though Kum and Kotake arguing about meaningless drivel as they're passing on to the afterlife is still peak comedy, unmatched gold. At number four, we have the bioelectric anemone, Baronade, the boss of inside Jabu Jabu's belly. Now I've gotta be honest, the Zelda team were absolutely cooking if they wanted to make a hard boss for their third dungeon, because give Baronade even the slightest buff to the damage it does with each attack, and you're looking at a boss that would likely kill multiple children. Phrasing Billy, Jesus fucking Christ. Baronade asks you to use the boomerang to stun the boss and do damage. In the first phase, it's placed firmly in the center of the room. You have to cut the tendons, connecting it to the ceiling with the boomerang, while avoiding a series of electric beams. I love how this boss doesn't hold anything back either. It'll then rotate the jellyfish creatures, known as Barrys, around its body, and you have to attack the boss until it decides to go full Beyblade, letting it rip as it begins doing a spin cycle around the room. From this point on, you've got to throw the boomerang at the body, hope it gets through the Barry Barricade, and stun the boss so you can attack the core. Or do what I did, and destroy all the Barrys first, so Baronade has nothing but his spinning and electric beams to fight you with. I just really appreciate they went all in on this parasitic cell, even down to the rather disgusting death animation where it grows various tumors and then explodes. I may not enjoy the Jabu Jabu Belly's dungeon, but I think its boss utilizes the dungeon weapon extremely well, and has the same claim of mechanical depth that Twin Rover has. Perhaps even more so. In another life, it could even be my number one. Hey all, sorry to be a bother, but I'm trying to reach 35,000 subscribers by October of 2024. If, after finishing this video, you like what you see, consider parrying that subscribe button to stay up to date on all my future videos. Back to the regularly scheduled programming. At number three, we have the evil spirit from beyond, Phantom Ganon, boss of the Forest Temple and the final Ganondorf fight on this list. As you'll see from my top three, movesets may be important, but a stellar visual design goes a long way. And Phantom Ganon, he's got that drip. This floating soldier in incredibly stylized armor with an incredibly cool mask riding a spectral steed, I mean, come on now. The first phase, where you're surrounded in this museum-like arena, paintings on all sides, is fantastic. 
as you're frantically searching for the correct painting to fire an arrow at the boss to do damage. But Phantom Ganon can fake you out, retreating at the last second before appearing in a different painting, which is a nice extra challenge. Once enough damage is done, his phase two is the introduction of Energy Tennis. And as I explained in my Ganondorf entry, my depth perception this time around was horrid as I failed time after time, even getting a game over. Now, had I been playing the 3DS version, I suspect I wouldn't have had the same problem, but there's something about the N64 graphics and control scheme that just had me on the ropes this entire time. Skill issue on my part, that's for sure, I'm not blaming the game here. I also love that his giant lance almost reads more as a staff in the second phase. It's such a cool weapon. Most importantly, I like that Phantom Ganon doesn't hold back in terms of attack damage. Compared to the Child Link bosses, Phantom Ganon lets the player know that the adults aren't holding anything back. I do find it funny though that Ganondorf claims Phantom Ganon was only a fraction of his power, when the Ganondorf fight ends up being a watered down version of this boss. Hilarity at its finest. At number two, we have the subterranean lava dragon, Volvagia, boss of the Fire Temple, and resident whack-a-mole enthusiast. While certainly not one of the toughest fights in the game, I think Volvagia does more than enough to be a fun boss fight, and has one of my favorite boss designs in the game. Though I also just think dragons are cool, sue me. To do damage to the boss, you have to wait for him to pop his head out of one of the holes, then use the Megaton Hammer to stun him and attack with either your sword or the hammer again to do lasting damage. He'll then dive back under and pop back out, either to chase you while breathing fire in your direction, which isn't hard to dodge due to his slow turning radius, but for me, fun to avoid and just watch Volvagia's movements, I don't know, I'm fascinated by that sort of thing. Or he'll use a move where he slams the ceiling of the cavern, causing an avalanche of rocks to fall. He cycles through these attacks, all the while trying to fake you out with the whack-a-mole portion, as he won't always appear from the first hole that begins to activate. The main critique against this fight is its length, as Volvagia has a lot of downtime between attacks, and I definitely agree, it's the main reason he's not my number one. But I think it was also my fault for using the hammer and not my sword to do the main damage to the boss when I had him stunned. I likely prolonged my experience by a little while, and I think if his moveset was just a tad faster, it would have been a perfect fight. I also just love his goofy face, his adorable design, the fact he was referenced in Tears of the Kingdom, and he'd be my number one if it wasn't for my pure bias towards... At number one, we have the Phantom Shadow Beast, Bongo Bongo, the boss of the Shadow Temple. Sealed away at the bottom of the well, it's able to break free and take refuge in the Shadow Temple, where you have to face off against it in glorious combat. And ever since I was a kid, I was enamored with this boss design. I love eldritch monstrous horrors and the detached arms, the gigantic dark pulsating eye, the way it hangs from the ceiling, it's unmatched, honestly, you know what? Smash. But more importantly, it loves a good bongo session and has a goofy ass name that just makes me fall in love with it that much more. Your goal is to stun his two hands, then use the lens of truth to see Bongo Bongo as he attempts to ram into you. Shoot his eye to stun him, then attack the eye with your sword to deal the big damage. The challenge here comes from his bongo drums, as every now and then, Link will be bounced up, or Bongo Bongo will move his hands, making them harder to hit. He's got a variety of different punching attacks, slams, shakes, claps, and a grab attack that got me a few times. If you're quick on your feet and not an absolute mess with the lock-on system like I was, you can probably end this fight extremely quickly. But I really enjoyed the difficulty that came from needing to target the hands efficiently and fast. Apparently, you can actually attack one hand with an ice arrow, freezing it and making Bongo Bongo use the other hand to break the ice, which leaves that hand in a vulnerable position for attacks. Just a fun tip I didn't get to try myself. Bongo Bongo is also the only boss on this list to absolutely fuck Link up in a cutscene unrelated to their chosen dungeon, as we see him get released from the well and ruin his and Sheik's day earlier in the game. Mad respect, mad respect. Sure, other fights in the game could be mechanically better, but Bongo Bongo is just my favorite. Like, you can't argue against that. Well done, my man. 
And that's my list. Which Ocarina of Time boss is your favorite? I know every single one has their defenders, so type those comments up down below and let me know. And be sure to parry that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of my future videos as they come out. I will soon be doing an Ocarina of Time dungeon ranking. Don't think I haven't forgotten about that one. My social medias are on screen now. Feel free to follow where you feel comfortable. I recommend my Twitter. It's the best place to keep in contact with me if you're interested in that sort of thing. A massive shout out to my YouTube channel members for supporting me for another month. It costs $4.99. You get early access to my Tuesday videos and you get a shout out at the end of the video and in the description. It really helps me out. Thank you so much to those of you who are supporting me. And a massive shout out to my patrons over on Patreon. I will be facing Patreon out at the end of June, so this is the last few months that we'll be seeing you guys. Thank you so much for the support over the years, you have been amazing, and I will see you guys in the next video. Adios!